but uh, in the session that we attended today, talking about like um, the uh, the uh, how we can like uh, improve the soil and make up and, and make the soil more fertile. This is what we need to take and bring back home. Because as I said, after the storm, all the soil were washed by the flooding. We need to come with a system where we can like uh, put like more ingredients to the soil and make it improve to help the farmers there and have them have a better life. Yesterday I was on the farm and uh, was on the grafting, grafting part and I've learned uh, how to graft uh, avocado. That will be a very helpful uh, part uh, in my job to go and the countryside and help the peasants to graft the uh, avocado, uh, any other trees that can graft it. So it's very important. It's not over yet. Keep it up because there's so many people that are in great needs around the world. They need you. Don't stop. Yeah, it's not you over. know that. It's, it's not, not over, over yet. yet. Yeah. Keep it up. Good job. Good job. Thank you so much. That's right. That's not give up. It's not over yet, right? That's a great reminder. Um, so it is once again a privilege to invite our next speaker, Mike Mueller from Hope Seeds. Um, <laughs> I'm a little nervous about Mike coming up here. I have known Mike for many, many years. Um, I'm much younger looking than I am. Um, but Mike has known me probably since I was a young kid running around in Haiti. Um, and so he might have embarrassing pictures of me and I'm a little nervous, but, but it is such a pleasure to have Mike come and share. Mike um, founded Hope Seeds in 1999. Um, Hope Seeds has shipped over 10 million packets um, of seed to 61 um, countries via over 400 different ministries um, during those years to agriculture workers and agriculture missionaries. Um, he has spent time um, selecting and developing vegetable varieties um, that are appropriate um, in the tropical setting. He has over 40 years of experience um, with international seed companies and Mike has, himself has made selections of varieties of tomato, pepper, squash, melon, cabbage, eggplant, and gourds that have been introduced to the world's market with all of them um, available in the public domain. Um, as I mentioned, I have known Mike for many years and I can tell you one thing, he is passionate about seeds, but Knowing Mike for so many years and being a family friend, I know he's even more passionate about spreading the gospel and serving others. Mike, it is a pleasure to have you come and share this year at the conference. Thank you. Wow, it is indeed a privilege to be here in front of this audience, this esteemed audience. Martin, 20 years ago this month, you and I had breakfast at the Cracker Barrel across the river. And I first met you and you explained to me all the work of Echo. My wife and I were just considering and just getting ready to launch our, our new journey into Hope Seeds, leaving the commercial seed industry and starting to work in charity work, as we called it then. I didn't realize what development work was all about until I got my feet wet. Brian, it was my privilege to spend the night in your bedroom in Port-au-Prince. And I'm glad to know you recovered from the shock and awe of my snoring that night. I wasn't going to mention <laughs> A lot of you in this room have uh, uh, received some Hope Seeds materials from us over the years. And uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a, more of a background of why I feel so moved to do this work for so long. My wife and I have, uh, previous to Hope Seeds, we were in the vegetable seed industry. But before that, before I ever met my wife, 
I was a son of a vegetable farmer. In fact, I'm the grandson of a vegetable farmer. In fact, I'm the great-grandson of a vegetable farmer. So you can say it's underneath my fingernails. It's part of me. It's my DNA uh, to live and breathe farming, and especially vegetable farming. And in the past 20 years, we have shipped a lot of seed to a lot of different countries. And I've been able to travel to some of those countries. And during that time, what I found was a deeper appreciation for how much seed is always available to us as more modern farmers in the United States and in much of the Western world. Seed has always been available to me and still is. But I was really kind of in awe and dumbstruck by how little the seed was available in developing nations. What even struck me more was that the seed that's available in those nations is what falls off our table. It's the leftovers. It's the antique varieties that the seed industry can no longer sell in a more developed nation. And so what that led me to understand is that there's nobody doing actually development work representing the needs of seed development in those countries. We're just giving them the scraps that fall off the master's table, as Jesus put it in his parable. I don't think that's the right way to do it, and I don't think this audience does either. So we started a program years ago at Hope Seeds we called the Seed to Save. And it's basically product development. The things that I used to do in the seed industry for many years, working alongside farmers in the United States. And product development is, is basically this in the seed industry. You, you get to know your farmers, your customers, your target audience, whatever you want to call them. And then you have a relationship with the breeders and the production companies that make that seed and you disseminate that information of what is necessary for the next years ahead. So that the breeders have an idea what to, uh, to breed for. And then you do the product development, you do the trialing, you do the selection work alongside both parties. So I took that old school approach, what has been done for many decades, and I've been using it as I travel around to different countries and find those needs, which are very extreme in many cases. But as a deeply religious person, especially for my love of Jesus and my appreciation of what the Bible teaches me, I have to have you start right with me at the first chapter. God had a strategic plan for all of us at creation. He says, I give you every seed-bearing plant. This will be your food. How more direct can God be to us that this is our food? This is our source. We need to respect that and take care of it and manage it and make it available to the whole world. It did not move. There we go. When you go to the New Testament, I love the parable, as a seedsman, I especially love this parable, about the man, the farmer, who planted good seed in his field. And if you remember the parable, it goes on a little bit further. That evening, an enemy of that farmer came along and spread tares as it says in the King James. Modern, more newer translations weaken that by just saying weeds. But the King James is very specific, and I think this audience can appreciate that. What Jesus was implying to the people in that audience who understood and appreciated the tear weed as a specific problem. And it had more than just a weed problem. It was a toxicity problem. It was a human health problem. And this enemy was doing something very dangerous to the farmer and to the people that would consume the wheat and make it into bread. The tares are nicknamed bearded darnel, and some of you might know it by the Latin. Uh, my friend Dave Unander could probably roll it right off his lips. Lolium temulentum, and I don't remember that. I have to look down at that because I don't carry all those Latin terms so easily on my tongue. But when you dig into that, that species, you find out a little bit more about the impact of what good seed means. Jesus was talking to an audience that appreciated what good seed would mean. It was appropriate to the land, the climate, and the culture. It had good germination, and it would have vigor. It was clean from weed seed, and it was pure for type. These are all segments that are on every valid seed packet by the Florida State Seed Laws, by the American Seed Trade. Jesus was implying this in that parable that the people at that time understood what good seed really meant. And at the same time, 
They understood the ramifications if it was not good seed, that it could have poor marketability because you would not have the right kind or a very low yield. And it would have economic hardships to the farmer. It could spread noxious weeds within the field for the many years to come. And there could be the potential to spread plant disease or a virus, maybe with nematodes. But those, uh, uh, the main thing about this particular species, that the tares, was the threat of human fatality. The endophyte fungus, the drunken nausea as it's called, could be spread among people that would consume bre wheat bread that had tares mixed with it. The Roman Empire had a law against such seed being intentionally planted because this had happened. So Jesus understood this implication to the people that were hearing his parable. So the implication of Jesus making sure that we understand good seed, I think we can appreciate that when we're working with people in different countries, we need to hand out good seed. We need to do the homework. Is this the right kind of seed? Does it have good germination? Is it right for their climate? Is it right for their culture? Those are all things as a seedsman, or as I call my, my wife calls me, a seed geek, because I can talk about this for hours, and most of you will glaze over like deer in the headlights and want to walk away and go to break early. Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about this because I'm excited about what I think you can learn and share with the people that you serve. What is old will become new again. I keep forgetting to push this button, sorry. There's two old methods that I think can be very useful today because a lot of the people we serve haven't used them before or they have forgotten how to use them. And so they're really new to a lot of the target audience that we're all mutually concerned about. The two words, population breeding and random mass selections. These are very unique and old ways of saving seed and producing more seed for the next year's crops. I'll start with random mass. Random mass is simply walking into a field and saying, that is a very nice plant. That is a very nice plant. I'm going to select the seeds from that plant and I'm going to save that for my next year's crop. Or I like this section of the field because it looks like it's going to be the cleanest and the best seed. I'm going to save that for next year's crop. That is random mass selection work in its simplest definition. Then there's the population breeding, where you might have made selections, or a farmer next door to you has given you one of his selections, and you decide to compare them, and you plant them in strips or in little patches, and you let them cross-pollinate. And then you have that population of seed coming back, and you have bred a new or an improved strain from that. An example I'm giving you in this picture is a man that we have given some seed to of, of an okra variety that we developed several years ago. He is in Uganda, and he has agreed to produce okra seed for Hope Seeds. So we gave him a, a variety that we used population breeding. We had two or three selections of the same genetic variety. It was originally uh, from Northrop King, and they got out of the okra business, so we picked it up and we started growing it. But we found several selections from other states that were a little bit different. So we decided to plant them in a patch in strip trials. We let it cross-pollinate, because it is an, an imperfect flower, and it will cross-pollinate from bees and flies. And we allowed that to make seed. We saved that seed, called, and we called it population breeding. This is an old technique. And then we turned that over to the farmer. And we asked him to intentionally grow it. He waters it. He cultivates it. And you can see how far apart he has it. It's pretty far apart for okra plants. Uh, but he has this field, and he's growing very nice okra. And then we teach him the philosophy of random mass selection. We want him to go through that field. And if he sees a superior plant, we want him to mark it. Not necessarily pull it out, but to mark it. And at the same time, while he's walking, we ask him to rogue that field. If he sees a plant that has a disease or does not look right, he doesn't like the the reddish veins in the leaves, or whatever his parameters are for selecting, we ask him to pull that plant out. So he's roguing those fields. These are old techniques, and they're very, very functional. 
To go a little bit further, the random mass selection of walking a field can also be used to make selections towards improving the traits or the conditions of the farmer or the area where you're working. In our case, we, we use our, our location in Missouri where it's very humid in the summer and very hot to make what we consider to be mimicking conditions in certain parts of Africa and in Haiti. And so we have a lot of root knot nematode, by the way, in our soil. So we're, we're constantly making selections for those that survive better, especially on okra, which is one of our choice varieties. And by the way, my wife did not like the idea of ever choosing okra as a species. She's from New York. This is a southern crop. She still considers okra snot in a pod. But I, I persisted, and, and I said, no, okra is a very important crop to a lot of people, and, and it's a poor man's vegetable, and we're dealing with a lot of poor people. So we want to give them a good variety. So this method that we taught this man of how to make selections was very useful. And then we used the population breeding towards intentionally larger plantings and collecting more lines that might fall out of that and, and make more selections. And they can be made in any part of the world. It might not always be the same improvement from Missouri to Nicaragua or to Uganda. You have to make those selections in those places. I want to give you an example of uh, how this was accomplished in history, the use of random mass. You know, carrots come from Central Asia uh, originally. There's many, many colors and varieties of carrots that you can find in the wild in that area. And, and in history, most carrots were actually red or purplish, and a lot of them were white to cream colored. And then there were yellow carrots. Occasionally you'd see an orange, but it was not the predominant trait to see orange carrots everywhere. It's hard for us to find a non-orange carrot if we go look for it now in the marketplace. Well, in the 16th and 17th century, there was a lot of carrots grown in the Netherlands. The soil was good for it there. And in fact, uh, the, the Dutch were known as carrot farmers by a lot of the people at that time. And they would grow a mass of carrots. Well, the House of Orange is the ruling class. And they wanted orange carrots. And so to the national uh, agronomists and botanists at that time, they were assigned the task to develop orange carrots because they knew it was available. So they made selections using the random mass and they pulled roots, then they replanted them in a special field, an isolated field, you, because they are biennial crops, they need to overwinter, they need to be vernalized, and they would bloom again the next spring. Then they would save that seed. And eventually they came up with strains of pure orange carrots. And they satisfied the House of Orange. Well, that spread all over Europe. And in the 17th century, the, one of the oldest seed houses in the world, the Vilmoran Seed Company, started offering Dutch orange carrots, the horn carrot and the long orange. This is an example of using the random mass and then the population breeding to accomplish that very thing. So selections are made for reasons. And there's a, quite a few really good reasons. If you're a seed geek like me, you start identifying those because you have gathered that inventory of needs from your customers, your farmers, the people you're trying to serve. And depending on where you are, it could be weather stress. You could have a lot of wind during the planting season or harvest season. You could have water problems. You could have drought problems. Then there's different diseases that come up that are, need to be chosen uh, and selected for resistance or tolerance to. Insects as well. Most every farmer concerns himself with yields. How can I get more crop off of my acre? And genetics sometimes is one of the first solutions. Then better flavors. And in America, I'm sorry to say, most genetic breeders have not worried about flavor because the farmers worry about yields and disease tolerance. And, and flavor is one of the last things they worry about. It's what you worry about. Uh, but I'm glad to say that there's a, a, a resurgence in breeders starting to do taste testing of the product they're actually releasing. And appearance is always important because most, especially in Western uh, grocery stores, we eat by what we see with our eyes. If it's not a perfect looking tomato, I'm not going to buy it. If it has a crack in it, I'm not going to eat it. Uh, that's the way we respond. But we can make selections to solve some of that. And one of the things that I think is underdone is the compatibilities to other species, especially for small plot farmers in this, or 
more resurgence of organic farming, the idea of compatibilities, growing different things together. Uh, for instance, growing cabbage next to dill and things like that that uh, uh, should be tested because some varieties do not like dill, but there are other cabbage varieties that thrive right next to it. And dill is a good deterrent plant to keep the white cabbage butterfly away. So there's things like that that are good examples. One of the great examples, I think, from most seed catalogs over the years uh, is the Detroit dark red beet. It was first found in a field by a Mr. Reeves in Port Hope, Ontario in the 1880s. And he was walking his field of, of, of a variety of beet called early blood. And he saw this unique plant, maybe several of them. I don't know. I don't have that written down. I don't have a videotape of it. Uh, but he somehow found these varieties and knew enough to make selections and save those roots and regrew seed. And eventually, the word got out that, that Mr. Reeves had a very, very good beet variety to sell in the market. And a seed company acquired some of that seed and started marketing it in 1892 in a catalog. Detroit dark red beet is still one of the predominant organic beet varieties that is available in U.S. markets today. Hope Seed sends this around the world as our preferred beet because it is a very res a resilient uh, species or variety to use in any garden or wherever we send seeds. Yet there's only a few production companies that are actually doing a good job of maintaining clean seed. They are again using that random mass technology of roguing the field for the off types. So it is an old school method that is very useful. Another great example from the past that is still useful today is Copenhagen market cabbage. This picture is of a young man, young farmer in Uganda. We just received this just last month. He's growing a fine head of cabbage, and it's not a hybrid. He's using some organic methods. He's been taught how to use the neem to, keep, uh, to make an oil spray and to keep insects away. Uh, he's doing compost tea. He's doing all kinds of things. So I think the, he's showing off very proudly uh, the benefit of his labor. But my impetus of showing this to you today is that this is an open pollinated cabbage. Not that there's anything wrong with hybrid cabbages, but this is an open pollinated cabbage that shows the potential of what can be done if somebody continues breeding on open pollinated varieties and for a market that cannot afford to buy hybrid cabbage seed. Open pollinated is still very useful. As a personal footnote, this variety was one of my grandfather's choices when he first started getting in as a young man into vegetable farming in 1929. I have a copy of his receipt of buying seed from Burl Seed Company out of Colorado. And this is one of the varieties he bought to grow as one of his cabbage varieties. So it's still around today, just as it was for my grandfather. There's a lot of other great examples. Uh, Crimson Sweet Watermelon is a wonderful tasting watermelon. Many of you have tasted it, I'm sure. It won an All-America Award uh, in 1964. So it's been around since the 1960s. And it's still the, the variety that is used to describe new hybrids. If you read the catalogs, you'll say it has a crimson sweet stripe, or it has a crimson sweet flavor and texture. So it is still very, very respected as a predominant variety. Poinsett cucumber, which I believe is on the Echo recommended list for a cucumber to go into the tropics, was first bred in, at Cornell back in the 1960s and 70s by Dr. Bob Munger. He had several different releases of the same cucumber. Florida high bush eggplant was selected by Florida farmers in the 1930s on the Palm Beach coast. Cal Wonder pepper, open pollinated, which is very good for the tropics, was bred by University of California in Davis. Floridade tomato, University of Florida, Dr. Ray Volan in Homestead, Florida, again in the 1960s. You go a little older, Chantenay Red Core Carrot was released by the Morse Seed Company in 1929. It was developed in Southern California. One of my favorite and yet least favorite vegetables is the turnip. I grew up on a vegetable farm that grew about 40 acres of turnips every year, and we pulled them all by hand, topping and, and detailing them and putting them in bags and putting them in storage and selling them for Christmas in the St. Louis market. We made a lot of money selling turnips, but I hated eating them, I still do. 
But I'm amazed that the variety that was released in 1885, purple top turnip, is still the majority of the turnip seed that is sold in the world today. This old variety still is proof that open pollinated vegetables can have a place in our, in our market. Now, a lot of this started to change in the 1960s and 70s in what has been called the Green Revolution. And any of you that have studied the history of agriculture, modern agriculture, respects and, and maybe admires like I do the name Norman Borlaug. Whether you agree with the Green Revolution or not, it's history, it's real, and it made an impact. It's still having an impact today. Norman Borlaug brought some unique methods and ideas. He was assigned the task by the Rockefeller Institute to our foundation to solve the wheat yield problems in southern Mexico. And what did he do? He used his knowledge of different sources of dwarf wheat. His philosophy was that dwarf wheat would solve the problem. And so he went down there with that attitude and brought all these different strains of dwarf wheat. And within 10 years time, he changed what was a deficit in wheat production to an export commodity for the country of Mexico because he managed and manipulated the genetics. And he made those things available directly to the Mexican farmers. None of that work was patented. None of it was for profit. It was designed to help the farmers. And I think that's what this audience has in common with Norman Borlaug. We care about our target audience. The other example close to that time was Dr. Jennings and Dr. Tanaka, who were assigned the task to solve the rice blast fungus problem in Asia. And again, they were funded in part by the Rockefeller Foundation, and the International Rice Research Institute gave them space to do this work. Within five years' time, they found the solution. The seed was disseminated, and the problem was solved, and rice production became very good again in, South, in, in many parts of Asia. Again, no patents, no profiting. It was handed out to the farmers. One of the key elements of what Borlaug and, the, and Jennings and Tanaka did was the use of pedigree breeding. They used their knowledge of resources and the network that was out there in the world, and they assessed these different lines that they thought would be part of the solution. And whether they were the solution or not is, is probably, probably very un unclear to us, but each one of those things was crossed by other things towards a solution. And they ended up making selections and made collections for those unique traits to solve their problems. They did isolation crossings. And there was no labo laboratory breeding. There was no genetic technology at that time. It was old school, wind and air and gravity and hand pollinations. And then old school of hand harvesting and hand uh, sorting all that seed. But using Mendel's law of, of, of genetic inheritance, which they understand and understood, many of you understand a lot better than me, uh, I jokingly tell my wife I have a PhD. I'm very similar to a compost farmer. I pile it high, uh, pile it high and deeper, and I turn it over often. That's my PhD. So I learn by being out in the field and learning by what these guys have done before me. But understanding Mendel's law of how to take that, uh, uh, that crossing that they did and make continuous selections over several years, they made new varieties available to the farmers. And some of them met or did not meet the intentional traits, but they showed benefits to many other areas. The other thing that I think is most unique about Norman Barlog is his breakthrough of using shuttle breeding. His work was in southern Mexico. And when he first got his uh, uh, first harvest, normally they would have waited to the whole next year to start over again. But he knew that they were just starting to plant wheat in northern Mexico. So against his boss's wishes, not spend any money driving what I guess was very non-existent roads back then, he drove his seed to northern Mexico and got it planted. And then he got another harvest. He got two harvests in one year and time to turn around and go back to southern Mexico and replant. So he really introduced to the entire world the method of doubling or tripling the amount of seed you can get done in research in, in one year's time if you shuttle that seed from one place to another. So it's now, we consider it old school, every seed company out there uses this technique to many different parts of the world. 
My example of how we've done this is, again, in my, fav my wife's favorite species. Uh, when we first started Hope Seeds, we recognized that okra was one of the, especially around the equator, was a very popular and necessary vegetable. But the only thing that was available to us was the uh, uh, Clemson spineless, which is a fine All-America winning variety, but it's only really bred for the southern, southern United States. So we assessed the USDA archives, and we found out that botanists from around the world have been saving all kinds of okra varieties from Asia and from Africa. And so we assessed several varieties. And we had, uh, of these 30 varieties, we planted trials, both in Florida and then in our place in Missouri. And we made selections, mimicking the pedigree selection process. And then we put regional strip trials. And we also had, at the same time, some isolation plots where we separated these okra varieties so we could save seed. These intentional isolations led to choosing two varieties that were extremely good, we thought, especially compared to Clemson spineless. Those two varieties were trialed here at the Echo Farm, and they came to be known as, as Gumby and Pusa McMally, their original names. Gumby was originally prelude from Northrop King, and we made three selections, or had three selections available to us, and we renamed it Gumby, because I always liked that claymation little character. I thought he looked like a, a, an okra pot, I guess. In Africa, they can't use that name. I don't know what it means over there in, in Uganda, but they, they decided to call it African Ladyfinger instead. So anyway, we have these two varieties that are very, very high yielding, and it's a good example of using both the pedigree uh, breeding and the shuttle breeding method. Go a little bit further, uh, back in my history, uh, how I used random mass work to make a selection. Smoke Signals Popcorn was one of our releases very early in our, seed, our own seed company. Back in the 1980s, uh, miniature popcorn became the craze, and everybody had to have a bunch of little miniature popcorn hanging on their door. You tie it to presents for Thanksgiving and things like that. And also about that time, there was a craze for whole ear popping corn. You could buy it in a little cellophane pack and put the whole ear in the, in the microwave and pop the corn. I said, well, why don't we put the two together, come up with an ornamental popping corn? And the genetics were there. I was able to assess uh, some, some popcorn growers that I knew in Michigan and also in, in Oklahoma and uh, from my own collection. And we found some varieties that were quite long and rather decorative. And so we planted strip trials. We did population breeding and we let them cross-pollinate. And then we did the random mass selection and went through there and picked the ears off the plants that looked like the best plants and looked like they had the best ears and had the colors we wanted, blah, blah, blah. I see you glazing over. <laughs> so we, we took those and we planted them the next year and within three years we had our own really nice strain of popcorn, ornamental popcorn. Now the mungo bean is a little bit different. Uh, it was a gift from a missionary from Nigeria. And mungo bean is really a black vigna, it's in the vigna bean species, it's originally from India. But somehow this missionary in, in uh, Nigeria said this is a great bean that a lot of people in our uh, area of Nigeria like to grow, but we've got some problems. And so he said there was some off-type colored beans in there and there was some disease showing up in, in his stock seed. So we took it and planted it at our farm in Missouri, and using that random mass philosophy, we walked the fields. And if it didn't look right, we just yanked it. We didn't care what it was. If it didn't look like the rest of the field, we pulled it and got rid of it. And then when we come to harvest time, we saw some, some pods that were a little bit different color, and we opened them up, and sure enough, they're kind of a gray bean as opposed to a black bean. So we threw them out. And then we took all what was left and turned it into one new population of stock seed. And when we grew it the next year, indeed, we had very shortly time cleaned up what was given to us as a nice Vigna bean. And we have redistributed that to a lot of areas. Another example of what Norman Borlaug taught me was uh, the pedigree breeding. I told you about the Gumby okra a little bit ago. We had those three different strains that we cross-pollinated in the field, and we've now had great success introducing this into Uganda. And uh, we have uh, many stories, and maybe this afternoon, if you come and visit with me some more, I'll tell you about the widow seed project that we have going in Uganda, where there's multiple widows now growing this okra variety, and now are sharing it with their neighbors in their own communities. The show-off sweet pepper is, 
is one of my favorite projects that I was very pleased to introduce to certain markets. Uh, if you ever had an Italian bullhorn pepper, how many you have? There's a few. You know they're sweeter than bell peppers generally. Because they're long and red, a lot of people think they're hot peppers, but they're really quite sweet. And they're very low in the capsaicin oil, so they don't cause indigestion for people that have problems with bell pepper. So it's a very nice pepper for slicing to include in salads and pizzas and things like that. And I wanted one that was very long so I could get more slices. It's that simple. I just didn't want to work as hard to clean the pepper. I just wanted to get more slices every time I cleaned the seeds out. So I had three or four strains. And since it's a perfect flower, we had to desiccate the bloom, and we cross-pollinated each of these lines. And then we saved the seed from that and grew it back out. We basically had a hybrid, but it was a hybrid of very similar traits. So it wasn't very different. When we saved the seed and grew out the F2s, we started doing population breeding, a production, and saved all that seed. Now, we, after several years of selection, we have a very, very nice line of very productive pepper. So intentional crossing can lead to some very good future open pollinated lines. There's some old school hand pollinations that you should consider, especially if you're dealing with imperfect flowers like squash and cucumbers and watermelons. Those things can be done. Simple uh, technology books are out there about how to do that uh, pollination process on squashes. And if there's anybody old school about it that likes simple, it's me. Because uh, I can teach anybody how to pollinate a squash bloom because it's, it's a big bloom and it's, it's easy to get in there and, and paint the uh, female ovary with the, the male flower. When it gets down to the bell peppers and the tomatoes, that's a little bit trickier for my fat stubby fingers. So I leave that to somebody else to teach. But it can be done. But you're, you're manipulating and, and transferring those desired traits. An example of what we're doing at, uh, in my work is tropical pumpkins. We have a collection of lines that come from different parts of the tropics. And since a lot of these lines are grown in rather wild environments and very little production work has been done to save seed, except save what is naturally growing wild, our, our work is rather simple on, on purifying those lines. We have some from Bahamas. We have some from Jamaica. We have some from Trinidad, uh, some from Florida. The La Primera is one. So what we have done is we, we intentionally self-cross those to make sure that our genetics are pure and stable within that uh, same line. And then we build up these strains of stock. Now we're intentionally crossing them by some bush type plants that we have acquired of in the same species. And our goal is to come up with some newer open pollinated releases of tropical pumpkin. Why would we want something new or different? The wild strains that are out there are accepted by the public in those places, but they have very low yields. They're expensive in the marketplace. They're not always available. By crossing them with something that's a more bushy type plant, we can make a, a, a plant that is more compact, will allow for more population per acre, and maybe make the size just a little bit smaller so it's more affordable to those that don't have as much money. But we can also create a, a potential new market for the poor people that are already growing this species in their, in their defined spaces. But my target goal is that it would be a seed that is produced there. It's their seed. It doesn't belong to me and we're constantly shipping more seed in. We want to make it more sustainable and have a regional accessibility uh, on, on that squash. So one of the things that uh, I want to lead to as I start to close here is that the Christian community really has a huge opportunity. We've had a huge opportunity for a long time, but it's getting bigger. The opportunity is upon us like we've never had before. I want you to ponder this for a minute. One-tenth of one percent of the world's population today, out of close to eight billion people, one-tenth of one percent is making the decisions right now of what the next generation is going to have for seed. That's 8 million people. That sounds like a big number. But if there's 250 people in here today and that same formula is put into place, that means one quarter of one of you is going to decide 
what the next generation is going to have for seed. One fourth of one person is making the decision. And that's a scary statistic. Take Dave Unander there, a former plant breeder, and you cut him and take his right arm off and say, okay, that's what's responsible for next generation seed, Dave. So there's, to make this point uh, uh, even more critical is that in the next 50 years, those of us that have studied the prognostications from the United Nations, we're gonna reach close to 10 billion people on the planet unless population increase slows down. So that we're gonna have a 20% or more increase in hungry people, and we're only gonna have 8 million people deciding what that generation's going to eat and grow. I think the Christian community has a great opportunity to resurrect these old school techniques and help people breed seeds where they are and for their own land and make it economically driven to fit them. So what we're doing at Hope Seeds, move, there we go, uh, is the Seed to Save program. We're saving varieties that are already in existence and trying to share them with as many people as possible. We also, my wife and I are starting a new initiative we're calling it Day 3 Seeds. How many of you remember what happened on Day 3 of creation? God made seed. And so it's that simple. God is going to empower us to help people make seeds. The core purpose of this new organization is to breed and develop new open pollinated vegetables that will be non-patented, will be accessible to any place in the world, and to teach future generations how to continue breeding open pollinated vegetables. That is the core purpose of Day 3 Seeds. And why? We wish to empower developing nations. And I'm going to say it a little differently with some emphasis. To empower developing people. We sometimes think about nations in mass. We forget to look them in the eye. And that's where we have to begin. We have to look people in the eye. Jesus was giving parables, and he looked people in the eye. I'm convinced of that. He didn't look over to the right or look over to the left. He looked them in the eye. And that's what we need to do when we empower people. We want to give them seed to save. We want to give them agri-dollars to fuel those local economies. This has been a phrase that's been tossed around a bit in the last few years. The tipping points, they're on us. They are here. We might not recognize it because we have plenty of food. And we have food we're throwing away all the time. And yes, indeed, the Norman Borlaug era is still upon us. And we're still producing more food than the world needs. There's still a lot of hungry people, but we've thrown away more than is necessary. But eventually, the population is going to go higher than what we can produce if we stay the way we are. We must change something and several things. We must uh, uh, be more respectful and be more mindful of how we use the resources to produce that food capacity and what genetics we offer to the world to grow than adequate food. Uh, in man's ingenuity and energy to maximize the wiser use of all of our resources, all of this capacity, including human skills. So how do we decide which species may offer the broadest scope of answers to the tipping points? I've made my choices. I would love to hear what yours are. Maybe there's some people out there in the world where we serve that can make other choices. How do we offer new varieties and, and methods of production to these people? How do we better do a job of collaborative effort to best serve the target audience? This effort here at ECHO is a fantastic example of how we can connect, how we can work together. But I say we're still practicing. We haven't got it perfected yet because and we haven't made the impact that I think is potential for us to make as a group. If this 250 people were to solve problems the way Norman Borlaug did, we would solve a lot of world hunger in a short period of time. Norman Borlaug had a couple very interesting things to say in the end of his life. He never patented any of his, excuse me, of his efforts, but he had this few words, food access is a moral right. And I think we can all buy into that. What I liked most about 
one book I just read is that it said it is not enough to just increase food production. We have to increase purchasing power of the underprivileged to gain access to newer and better agriculture. And that's what this conference is about, accomplishing some of those goals. And my addition would be we need to teach old school seed development to people that don't know it yet. It's new to them and it has great potential. I want to remind you of one thing as, as I, I'm a student of history and I like studying uh, past cultures and what they did to accomplish and how they accomplished it and how they failed eventually. But one thing is very clear. No world power, past or present, has come to its potential on an empty stomach. They have had food security one way or another. Any world power that denies that is lying to itself. Any aspiring nation has to embrace that fact. I met a young farmer in Uganda a few years ago. And I'm fighting a cold and I'm looking for my hanky. What did I do with it? <laughs> it's gone. Oh, here it is. Young farmer in Uganda said, if you keep knowledge from me, you steal from my future. And I embrace this. I think it's, it's loaded with some heavy, heavy stuff to put on our plate. It reminds me of what Sir Francis Bacon said in the 16th century. Knowledge is the rich storehouse for the glory of the creator and the relief of man's estate. These two men have a lot in common, past and present. I want to show you a few things that we're working on uh, that we have identified as sources of uh, new nutrients, new vitamins, new production of, of vegetables. Trinidad Tropical Pumpkin originally was handed to me by I think it was Dan Sonke of Echo. I don't remember who was in charge of the seed bank way back about 15 years ago. Maybe it was Grace. I don't know who was in charge then. But uh, uh, they handed me a, a strain, and it was, it was very interesting, but it had a few off types and weird types in it. And so we started doing some self-pollinations, and, and what you see on the screen is what I'm shooting for. This is the pumpkin that some friends of mine from Uganda and friends from Haiti last summer said, this is the shape we want. This is the fruit quality we want. And it, it is distinctively dark compared to what they already have on the marketplace. So it'll be easily identifiable if we release this, when we release this to their own use. We have a tomato program. Echo has been collaborating with me on, on container tomatoes. I'm a firm believer that the majority of those we wish to serve live in urban areas and have limited to no space, but they love tomatoes. Tomato is the number one vegetable in the world as far as people's requests and what they like to cook with and slice and dice and however you want to use it. And my grandkids say ketchup is a food group. You know, <laughs> that comes from tomato. They don't recognize that. They won't eat tomatoes, but they'll eat the ketchup. So it's, it makes sense for me to, to, to view the steakless tomatoes as a uh, container tomatoes as a new source of vitamins and minerals for a lot of people. This is a variety called steakless. It only gets about two foot tall. Only gets about three or four tomatoes on it, and they're all the size of your palm. But their genetics are there for me to cross that by other tomatoes that are maybe a little bit bigger and a little more productive and still give me a very confined space tomato. Another one that uh, example of what we're working on is maybe some genetic preservation. This was handed to me by a missionary who was working in Kyrgyzstan. And we just called it the Kyrgy Long Hot. The Dungan Chinese uh, use this as a very, very preferred uh, spice pepper with their kimchi and also for their dehydration. And we're going to re-release it after we clean up the virus that was infected into the stock seed. We have a Napoleon pepper which we're using. Uh, bell pepper, Lamoyo type. We're cleaning up. This originally came to us from uh, Seed Savers Exchange, and we found that it had some pollution in it, and we wanted to clean it up and make it reavailable. We have several unique, non-traditional vegetables that uh, I think should be very popular in the market if their people are given a ch chance to just taste it and not look at it with their eyes. We have a pink Roma tomato. That's an heirloom in Missouri. It's very, very productive very tasty, and it's uh, um, 
very disease tolerant. Echoes had it in the ground, uh, trialing over here under Florida conditions. I don't remember what the taste tests came out of it. But my wife and I love it for sauce. The Italian gold sweet pepper is one of our favorite eating peppers, and it could be grown in containers as well as in the ground. We have a selection of loofah, the yard-long loofah. There's an example of a dried one hanging on our booth back there. Um, it's a wonderful vegetable. A lot of people don't even think of loofah as a vegetable, but it is an in, indeed a very good variety. And then the white cucumber down there, Blanco, is a very, very unique cucumber. It's very low yielding, but it's the best tasting cucumber I've ever eaten. It also is the best disease tolerant cucumber I've ever seen anywhere in all my travels. And it is predominantly male bloom. So it'll be a great breeding item for us to use for making new varieties. As I wrap up, I want to remind you that, uh, of my personal motivation, and it's one of our slogans at Hope Seeds, that no man should go hungry for the lack of seed. And I want to throw in the parable with it again. No man should go hungry for the lack of good seed. Remind you of that parable one last time as I close. A farmer planted good seed. Jesus was right. The good seed was essential. It's essential for us to use that. Potential and the privilege remains today for all of us. The risks and the troubles continue just as they did for the farmers of that time. And the need and the hope of all mankind are the same. Jesus is still the hope. So share it. Plant a seed. Feed a soul. Thank you.